go now to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we are so grateful to be your people. We are so thankful to be called together as the Church of Christ and to have the opportunity now to worship you and to sing together, to pray together, and to hear from your word. And we pray, Lord, that tonight would be a great blessing to all of us. Lord, we are thankful. We are exceedingly thankful for all that you are doing here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. You continue to pour your blessing upon us. You continue to show us your faithfulness to your people and your covenant love for us, even when we acknowledge, Lord, that we are not deserving. We are so thankful for the grace that you continue to give us, Lord, that you have held us together in unity and love for one another. We are thankful, Lord, for the continual growth that we have experienced, giving us more and more opportunities to minister the gospel to our own community. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this evening as we celebrate together in the ordination of our dear brother, Glenn. We're thankful for him, for his family, their love for the Lord, their love for this church, and his service. And Lord, as we come to this time, We pray that you would help us, that you would help us to recognize uh, this great office that you have called him to and the proper ordering of your church. And so we ask, Lord, that you would be pleased in all that we seek to accomplish tonight. And we pray you would do it all for your glory. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you want to join me in your Bibles, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And one of the ways to determine the health of a local church is to look at its leadership. When we see new leadership coming into a church, not replacing the old, but coming into and alongside the leadership that's been here for a while to make it stronger and better, there's an indication that a church is healthy. As churches grow, and by God's grace, that has been our experience for a while now, there is a continuing need for more men to serve the body of Christ as officers. And so we trust that God will in time, make known to us who those men are and how their gifts will fit uniquely into our context and they will meet the qualifications of the scripture. And so we should have the expectation that as the church grows from time to time, we should also see men who are being qualified by God to be pastors and there should be men who through their gifts and who have a a heart and a desire uh, to serve the church, we'll see in their abilities to do so that they have the gifts to be deacons. We should also see men who are developing hearts for church planting and men and women who have a heart for the nations and a strong desire to give themselves to the mission field and men and women finding their roles within the body of Christ in its normal Uh, weekly functioning in things like Sunday school and Bible studies and prison ministries and nursing home ministries and many more things. All of these, as they're going on and as we see people using their gifts in wonderful ways, they're all signs of a healthy local body. We should all be really thankful and remember that. It's by God's grace alone that we're here together, that we are unified that we are loving one another because apart from the grace of God, this would all fall apart in a second. Now with that being said, it's a good thing that we can come together and celebrate tonight as Emmanuel Baptist Church, a time to give thanks to God for raising up and installing new leadership in a body and doing so not with division and not with disagreement, but with great unanimity and joy. So tonight... We are doing things a little bit differently to install and lay hands on and pray for another man to serve as deacon. So I want to look at the office of deacon afresh. And I want to look at the two main sections of scripture where we see this. First, the biblical establishment of the office of a deacon. And second, where we see the qualifications for a deacon. 
We'll then look at the duties and responsibilities of a deacon within the body of Christ. And then finally, I will give a charge to our new deacon and to the church. We will close with the laying on of hands and prayer from the pastors and deacons who currently serve. So let's look first at the establishment of the office of deacon. That's Acts chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Well, it's important to understand what had gone on since the ascension of Christ into heaven at this point in the life of the church. The gospel was being preached and the Lord was using that preaching significantly uh, powerful in the lives of the people. They were being saved day by day. Sometimes we read in the book of Acts by the thousands. The church was growing rapidly to say the least. Now, there certainly have been revivals throughout the history of the church over the last 2,000 years, but nothing of significance that compares to what was going on in those early years. And so the apostles were going around preaching the gospel. People were being saved by the hundreds, sometimes the thousands. Churches were being established. Pastors were being appointed. But there were so many people with so many different things going on, that in time, everything became overwhelming. The church, very early on, you can see in chapter 2 of Acts, had a conviction of the importance of caring for its members. And so they were joyfully giving of their resources to meet the needs of one another, and things were going well. Now, Something any pastor wants, and this was absolutely the desire of the apostles, is to have unity in the church. And anything that might threaten that unity, they want to deal with immediately. You find a biblical solution to do whatever is possible to make sure that unity is maintained. So as the church was growing, that unity was being threatened. And that's to be expected and and something all of us need to be aware of. Whenever the Lord gives growth, we have to be careful that we continue to strive for unity. But in the early days of the church, unity was being threatened because we have the Greek-speaking Jewish widows who were being overlooked in the daily distribution probably a distribution of food and other living expenses. That needed to be fixed. Now, we shouldn't speculate as to why they were being neglected. The text doesn't tell us. There could have been a lot of reasons. It probably had something to do with a large concentration of people in a certain area, but we don't really know. We just know that they were being neglected in the distribution. Now, the ministry of the apostles had grown rapidly, and there was a very real possibility that they could have gotten off track from what they were called to do by God, what they were appointed to do by Christ himself, and so they had to make sure that this problem was being dealt with. However, they couldn't be the ones to do it. They were called by God to focus their attention on prayer and preaching and teaching and most certainly on establishing new churches. And remember, for the apostles especially, this wasn't just one church in a small community. This was numerous churches in different areas. They were traveling, they were following up with churches, they were appointing elders, they were writing letters, trying to keep things on course, and so they had to call on the church to appoint men. And it tells us in verse 3 that these men were to be of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, to tend to the physical needs of the Christians in the church. This was the official beginning of the office of deacon. And it seems evident that to be a deacon involved a number of different functions in terms of serving others, especially in connection with giving relief to the poor. So when we think deacon, 
we should think first and foremost of one who has a responsibility to lead through his service. He has a responsibility to take care of the more practical needs of the church for the purpose of making sure that the needs of the people are met and the, pastor, and the pastors of the church are freed up to minister the word of God in the way that God has ordained. So the role of the deacon includes relief of the sick and the poor. It also includes managing the church's finances and property ensuring that all of the circumstances of worship are in place and working properly, and managing all sorts of different areas of service around the church. It's a huge undertaking. And the more people we have as members in our church, the greater the need is for more faithful, qualified men to ensure that everything runs smoothly. Now, practically, what we see coming together is that elders and deacons work together like left and right hands, with elders specializing in leading by their prayer and ministry of the word through preaching and teaching and counseling and oversight of the church and all that she's involved in, and deacons specializing in leading through their practical works. Both offices are leadership offices, but that leadership is in different areas within the body. Unfortunately, many modern churches have confused these offices and what ends up happening in a lot of churches is that deacons become sort of de facto elders and there's no clear lines of authority and structure. And eventually those whom God has gifted to lead as pastors no longer have any authority in the church whatsoever. They essentially work for the deacons. It's not what God designed. I remember when I was 24, 25, right out of the army in my first church, this was exactly the motto. I was a pastor in the church. I was, a, uh, I was able to sit in on all the church's committee meetings, and there were tons of them, but I didn't have a voice. I didn't have a vote on any of them. They called the shots, and the chairman of every committee was one of the deacons. And so that's how it was run. But that's not what we see in the text. We must have clear lines of distinction and ensure that everyone serves within the parameters of what they're gifted to do and what they're called to do. The more dogmatic a church is about this, and the more a local church ensures that its leadership roles and responsibilities are well-defined, the better it functions, the more unified it is, and the more the church as a whole knows that it's being cared for and loved. And so the deacons were appointed and they began to fulfill their calling, doing works to minister to the needs of the church and to fulfill the commands of God. Notice then in Acts 6 that the calling and service of the deacons are closely tied to what we see happens in verse 7. We see the office established. We see these men begin to serve. And then in verse 7 it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now Luke was a very careful writer. He wrote the way that he wrote for a reason. And he's showing here that once the apostles were all the more freed up to preach and teach the word of God and the good works of the service that was being done by the deacons were ongoing, the works of these two offices came together to produce a God-glorifying situation in which the Lord was was pleased to work in the hearts of unrepentant sinners to remove the scales from their eyes so that they might see and believe that the Lord is good. So the diaconate is one of the main avenues that the Lord uses to build bridges between his church and the world. Deacons are the first line of ministry when it comes to extending mercy to the members of the church and also to the community. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works and give glory to the Father who's in heaven. And when the, when the world sees the church doing what it does in terms of loving and serving one another and her neighbors, they are baffled. They wonder, what's going on there? In the early fourth century, the Roman emperor Julian regretted the progress that 
the Christians were making because it was pulling people away from the Roman gods. He wrote a letter, and in this letter he wrote this. Atheism, and when he says atheism, he's talking about Christianity because they're not worshiping the Roman gods, so he called them atheists. Atheism has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. This was his assessment of what the church was doing. And so that work that is to be led by the deacons is being done in such a way that the emperor himself has to admit they're doing what we should be doing, but we don't, and as a result, people are becoming Christians. Now, of course, we recognize, as Jesus said, opportunities to serve the poor will always be present. They will always be among us. And so it takes wise, calculated leadership and gifted men to be able to lead and properly steward the resources that have been given to us by God to fulfill our calling and to do all that God commands in ministries of mercy for the church and for the community. But notice, we're talking here about deacons leading in these areas. That doesn't mean they do all of the work themselves. Every believer Every Christian in the church ought to be working to develop an eye for human need, to see who is in any special adversity, and then working to see how that adversity could be uh, alleviated and how to work as an, an ambassador of Christ in the context of mercy. Now this, of course, is driven by our knowledge and our understanding that Christ redeemed us by a servant deed of love in his substitutionary atonement. In our caring and serving, we are simply following the example of Christ. Romans 15.8 describes Jesus as a deacon or as a servant of the Jews in order that by his death he might purchase the Gentiles for his kingdom. He is the great deacon, humbling himself to the utmost in love for the sake of our redemption. In his self-sacrifice, Jesus served us by dying for us. It would be strange then if the message of the cross were ever disassociated from loving deeds that demonstrate this love to a dying world. The ultimate purpose for God's doing good works through the church is the proclamation of the greatest message of all time, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would be wrong, it would be a dereliction of duty for us to go about doing good works without also proclaiming the fact that Jesus Christ has come into this world to save sinners. That he has come to live a sinless life, fulfilling the law of God. That he has come to die on a cross, to take upon himself the wrath of God in the place of his people. That he was buried in the grave and raised three days later to conquer sin and death, that by faith alone we might have everlasting life in him. Were that not the message tied to the good works of the church, we would not be fulfilling our calling as the people of God. And to lead in those works is the responsibility of the diaconate. Well, we see the responsibilities of these men, but what kind of men must they be? We saw a few details in Acts chapter 6, but there are even more specific details if you want to join me in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, outlined the qualifications for a deacon. Now again, of course, the apostle is trying to help the churches that have been planted to be well established and to function according to God's design. And so here in 1 Timothy, uh, prior to this, uh, he gives the qualifications for overseers or pastors, elders, whatever you want to say. They're all synonymous terms. But here he gives the qualifications for deacons beginning in verse 8. And he writes, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. 
they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now in Acts 6, the apostles said that the deacons need to be men of good repute and full of the spirit and wisdom. They had to be men with good reputations. It was vital that these were men in the church who were, uh, who were well spoken of and known as men of good repute, not just in the church, but also in the community. A good name is of great value. Believers need good names if the church of Christ and the gospel will have credibility to the world. It's not okay if a deacon is well spoken of in the church, but outside in the community, people could bring credible charges against him. Now, of course, it's important to highlight that I said credible charges. People will falsely accuse Christians of all sorts of things, but if there are credible charges... Say a man is a cheat in his business, or he is an adulterer, or he, he has nefarious relationships with other people. It would hurt the reputation in the entire community of believers for having such a person as a leader in the church. The devil, you better believe, would seize on that and use that opportunity to harm the church, so leaders in the church must be men of good repute. And that means that while a man may fall, yes, we are all sinners and we do things we're not proud of and that often we will regret. But when men fall, sometimes that means that they're no longer qualified to serve in leadership in the church, not because they can't be forgiven by Christ and his people, but because his name and his reputation matter. Brothers and sisters, this is so important. And it's so important that you are praying for your pastors and your deacons regularly for this very thing, for your own good too, not just ours. It's for the good of the entire body of Christ. Pray that we will be men who are honest, that we have integrity, and that we strive to live holy lives. Pray specifically for the deacons, that they are men who can be trusted and counted on because they'll be managing the church's resources and leading others, and caring for others. You can't have Judas as a deacon. It won't work. But this man also needs to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. It means a man's entire life will be controlled and guided by the Holy Spirit. And one evidence of the Spirit's work in his life is that he has wisdom and acts and makes decisions in accordance with biblical wisdom. Listen, deacons have to make decisions sometimes that are very difficult. Naturally, because they are deacons, they are men who have a natural heart to serve and in part of that serving is, is giving, is being compassionate and being generous. And when people have needs, they have to make wise decisions about whether or not giving is actually helping, but sometimes it could be enabling. And that's hard because we want to trust people. We want to be able to help. We want to do everything we can to relieve suffering. But a wise man guided by the Spirit will be able to work out the fact that sometimes when people are in bad places, the most helpful thing we can do is not necessarily give them what they are asking for. That's not easy. And that takes wisdom. That takes the Spirit of God. Now let's consider these requirements that Paul gives to Timothy. He begins and says, first, a man must be dignified. That is, he is a man with serious conduct. He is worthy of respect. He's honorable. He's respectable. When someone looks at his life and his character, he's a man who has things put together. He's not perfect. 
He's not flawless, he's not without mistakes and sin like the rest of us, but he is a man who is known to be able to organize his life well. A deacon, Paul writes, is a man who is not double-tongued. In other words, he doesn't have a habit of saying one thing to one person and another to another person or saying one thing and meaning something else. His word is sincere. Being insincere and being deceitful would threaten the credibility and the stability of the fellowship of the body of Christ. Our tongues are powerful, and what we can do with them is very serious. So we must not only look to men whose yes is yes and whose no is no, but we must see that conduct played out before us week after week after week. He's a man who is free from gossip and lies. And he seeks to edify and encourage others with his speech. He must be able to control his tongue. Paul says a deacon must not be addicted to much wine. In other words, he's a man who doesn't have a compulsive need for alcohol. He can get through the day without having the need for a drink. He's not known as a man who always has a drink in his hand. And if and when he does drink, he does so with self-control, understanding that alcohol is a gift from God to be handled with care and responsibility, not recklessness and not looseness. He must be prepared to serve and lead in service, requiring him to act in self-control. A deacon must not be greedy for dishonest gain. Deacons, especially because they are charged with the oversight of the resources of the church, cannot be men who are beset with greed. Greed is actually a characteristic that you see in false teachers. But deacons in the church cannot be marked by greed because they will be in places where they might be tempted to steal or to take advantage of people or circumstances for their own personal gain to the detriment of the church. He must work for the well-being of the church and not for the well-being of himself. A deacon must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. The upright conduct and character of a deacon can only be sustained by continued faithfulness to the Christian faith. Deacons must know and trust God's plan of salvation and hold wholeheartedly to the truth of God's word. Within any local church, a deacon must fully embrace the church's confession of faith. If he is to lead, he has to be able to lead with a clear conscience in full support of the doctrine and teaching of the church and the leadership of its elders. Now, to be a member of a local church, the main requirement is that a Christian holds to the essentials of the Christian faith. And that's about it. That's all we typically require for a person to be a member of the church. But from there, depending on where a person wants to serve in the church, there is an increasing need for them to affirm certain doctrinal positions that are aligned with the church's confession of faith. For example, to be a Sunday school teacher, there's a great responsibility to hold to certain truths that the church holds dear. A person can be a wonderful Christian, a wonderful member of the church, but it wouldn't be right to have them teaching in the church if they hold positions on various doctrinal matters that the church rejects. However, that doesn't necessarily mean they understand or hold to every jot and tittle in the confession of faith. There may be areas of disagreement that wouldn't necessarily interfere with the ability to serve in certain capacities, but... To be in leadership as an officer, as a pastor, as a deacon, a man must wholeheartedly affirm the teaching of the church's confession as an apt summary of the most important doctrines found in Scripture. Likewise, this means there are no discrepancies between the man's lifestyle and his profession of faith. He won't be exposed as a hypocrite Now, while deacons differ in one way from elders in that they need not be apt to teach, that is a requirement of elders that you don't see with deacons, they must be capable encouragers of others in the gospel. 
giving sound biblical counsel as needed, particularly as they minister to those with physical needs. Their understanding of the scriptures, their understanding of God's will for godly living must be sound. He must be a spiritually mature man. But please take note, a deacon is not required to have a public ministry of any kind. What I mean by that is he need not be required to speak or to preach or to teach or to pray in public settings. This isn't the role of the deacon. Now, it's not a biblical requirement. He may be willing, he may be able, and that's great. And, and there may be opportunities for him to do so. And he should be encouraged to if that's the case. But we have to be careful not to put extra requirements on a man that the Bible itself does not. Now notice also, there are no requirements about his age, or his success in business, or his financial status. Trust me, there are many churches that take all of this into consideration contrary to the teaching of Scripture. To serve as a deacon, a man, Paul writes, must be tested first and prove himself blameless. Now, of course, blameless does not mean that he's sinless. But he does not have a life marked by continued unrepentant sin or reckless living. To discern this, a season of testing is necessary. His life and his reputation and his ability to serve in the capacity of a deacon is making sound decisions and making himself available to serve others. That must be clear to the church. Now this, of course, must take place before a man is ordained as a deacon. And this is something for the whole church to be involved in. We are congregational as Baptists. And so installing men, calling and installing men to office is a decision of the entire church, not just the elders, not just a few select people within the church. This is the church's decision. And so this process is, as we do it here at EBC, we, we have our advisory ballots that go out once a year, and uh, you as a congregation identify if there are any men that you see who are possible candidates for elders or for deacons, and the elders take that into advisement, and we consider that alongside our own thoughts of who we're looking at and considering Uh, We weigh in the balances everything that we know about this man. There certainly may be things that we know that the congregation doesn't and why, uh, you may wonder why sometimes, oh, I, I circle this name all the time. Oh, there may be other issues going on that you're not fully aware of. But we have this time of advice from the congregation for us to consider. And then the elders might have a man that they think we should consider as a church together. And so we might approach that man and ask if he'd be willing uh, to be considered for the office, either as a pastor or as a deacon. And if so, we present him to the congregation and say this man is being put forward as a consideration for this particular office. And you have, according to our constitution, you have three months, three months to examine that man. If you don't know him very well, it's a good time to get to know him. If you have specific questions about his life or about his faithfulness or there's certain things you've, you have observed and you want to know more about, it's a time to ask those questions. And it's incumbent upon you to get answers to those questions. And so we have this time, we have this three months, and at the end of that three months, we come together and we vote as a congregation. And if that vote is to the affirmative, we come to a day like today where that man is installed. So we have a process, and this is according to the scriptures, that the man be tested first and to prove himself blameless. But I will tell you, no man for the office of deacon will ever be put forward as a candidate for deacon, if his life is not already marked as one where he is doing the things that deacons do already. It's important, and, and this is showing forth the, the natural gifts that he has that God has given to him. That he, is, he has an eye for service. He recognizes when things need to be done and he does them, not because he's been asked or, or he's, he's been a, uh, appointed to do a certain thing, but simply because he sees a need and seeks to fill it. And so he must be tested 
and the church must be involved. Now, Paul continues, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. The wives of deacons must be women who are reverent and worthy of respect. They're not gossips, they're not slanderers, and they have self-control. The wife of a deacon, if he is to be qualified, must be a woman whose reputation is not that of a busybody. Elders and deacons are privileged to know a lot of things about a lot of people's lives. And sometimes that means that our wives will know some of those things. So if one of our wives is given to gossip or to being a busybody, no one in leadership can be trusted. There's not, that, that's not safe for the church's unity. That's not healthy. And so, yes, a man's wife, while he might be qualified in and of himself, a man's wife can be a disqualifying factor in his ability to serve the church. Speaking of wives, Paul says a deacon must also be the husband of one wife. Or another way to say that is that he is a one-woman man. He doesn't have more than one wife. Probably far, uh, far more relevant in the context that Paul was writing in, but nevertheless... Certain places in the world, that certainly comes out, but hopefully none of our deacons have more than one wife. And he is faithful to the wife that he has. Deacons should be known not just as married men. If they are married, they don't have to be married. Marriage is not a requirement. But if he is married, that he shouldn't just be known as a husband, but he should be known as a good husband. A man who truly loves and cares for and leads and protects his wife and lives with him in a loving, patient, and understanding way. Now, along those same lines, Paul says a deacon must manage his children and his own household well. Now, this doesn't mean all of his children will be believers, but it does mean that the the man is leading his home so that his children, if he has children, are obedient to him and follow his discipline and his instructions. Now listen, kids can be tough. And if they're not converted, our expectation of a church needs to be managed. But at the very least, a a man who is leading well should be able to lead his children in such a way that they respect him. The stereotypes that pastors and deacons should have unruly children is not biblical. We should not be distracted from leading the church well by having a home that is not led well, a home that is disorganized with children who are disobedient and unruly and have no respect for their father. Lastly, Paul offers an encouraging word. He says, For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Deacons should be men who will be highly regarded by the congregation. Such high respect should not be their motivation, of course, but it can function as an encouragement for men to fully dedicate themselves to doing the work that they're called to do with great confidence. They are officers of the church, and they ought to see themselves as officers of the church. They ought to be respected by the congregation as officers of the church. And when all of these things come together alongside the ministry of the pastors, God is pleased to strengthen the love and unity of the church and its effectiveness in reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, having seen the establishment, the purpose, and the duties of these men of good repute, we have Glenn Trope, a man whom the church has called and has examined and is being installed and ordained as a deacon of Emmanuel Baptist Church this evening. It is a great blessing to us. And I hope that all of you have taken the time to get to know Glenn and his family better. They've been here uh, for, I think, six years now, 
longer than I have, and uh, very thankful for Glenn and his service that he's already taken up himself, as I mentioned before. He was a man, as the elders were talking, that we recognized before this was ever brought up to him. He was already finding ways to serve within the body that we could identify and say, this man has the qualities of a deacon. And so we're very thankful for that. Now, of course, we can look at all of these qualifications for a deacon and say, really, any Christian man should strive to fulfill these qualifications. This is really the qualifications for what it means to be a faithful Christian man. But from within that, and I I pray that all of our men are just like this, but from within that, you see those whom God has particularly called for this office through the service that they provide. And so we come together to, uh, to appoint, uh, excuse me, to um, install and ordain Glenn this evening. But first, as the church, we must be reminded of our responsibility toward our deacons. A few things on this. First, above all else, the church must pray for those, to call, those who are called to lead and to serve. Appointing a man to office in the church is to no avail if him and his family are unsupported by prayer. Pray for Glenn's leadership in his home as the chief leader and teacher of his wife and children. Pray for his purity in heart and thought, in word and in deed, keeping alert to avoid the temptations of the evil one. Pray for confidence and wisdom as he uses opportunities given to him by God to make known the glorious truth of the gospel. Pray for his eyes to be focused, always looking for opportunities to lead the congregation to love and serve our neighbors. Pray for any unbelief that keeps him from looking daily to the cross to see the all-sufficient, all-satisfying supremacy of Christ. Secondly, support Glenn as a servant of the church. And as he serves, you likewise should look for opportunities to serve him and his family. Sometimes when someone is committed to serving others and is called to that specific task, others can forget to return the blessing. We need to be aware of that tendency and work to make sure our deacons are served well. We walk this journey of faith together. And so don't be lax in encouragement and hospitality and deeds of service and love to Glenn Trope and his family. Third, follow the leadership of Glenn as a man called and appointed to the diaconate. As a man who is capable of leading in mercy and fulfilling the duties and obligations of the office of deacon, much is required of the church in trusting him and following him in the areas where he has been called to lead. Pray, encourage, and follow. This is the charge to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And may God give us grace to fulfill this calling in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Glenn, I pray you will take this to heart, this following charge. Be dignified. Recognize the seriousness of purpose in all that you do as a deacon and as a man of God. And be keenly aware of the lasting effects of your conduct as a believer in Jesus Christ and as a leader in ministries of mercy. Do not take your service to this great office lightly. Do not be double-tongued. Be a sincere man of your word. Let your no be no and your yes, yes. Do not be, strive to be a pleaser of man, but be a faithful servant of God. At times, this will cause great distress, perhaps even division or hardship or trials in your life. But far greater it is to be faithful to God than to be exalted by man. <clears throat> Brother, do not be given to addictions of any kind. Continue to work and strive to stir up greater and greater affections for Christ above all things that this world has to offer. And while you are free in Christ to enjoy many liberties as a believer, do not allow these liberties that you have to enslave you so that you are no longer free. Do not be greedy for dishonest gain. In all that you do in your work, in the church, and in your home, do it honestly. Set your heart on making much of Jesus in all things, bringing glory to the Father who is in heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit, and recognize that all that you have is a gift from God to be used for the purposes of God. 
Hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Press on in your study of sound doctrine. Continually obey God's truth as it is revealed in Scripture. Take every opportunity you have to proclaim the gospel in word and in deed and in grace and in truth. You are a great student of the word. Do not grow slothful in your your zeal. Keep yourself as the husband of one wife. Be a one-woman man and lead your household well. Speak well of your wife to all others. Pray for her. Teach and lead her. Consult her and listen carefully to her insight. Live with her in an understanding way. And in all ways, strive to be a great visible representation of Christ's relationship to the church so that he would be exalted and honored in the relationship that you hold so dear. Glenn, in all of this, you will gain a good standing for yourself and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And with joy, we celebrate this day with you for what God is doing in your life and what he will continue to do in your life for the good of the church. We also celebrate these great things that it means for Emmanuel Baptist Church, but ultimately we celebrate what this means for the glory of God. One of the primary writers of our confession of faith was a man by the name of Nehemiah Cox. And Cox once preached at a deacon ordination, much like today. And he closed with these words. He said, you deacons have a trust committed to you, namely, the alms and contributions of the church, which are indeed a kind of hallowed or dedicated things, and this is a considerable trust. Yea, the poor members of Christ, which are dear to him as the apple of his eye, are committed to your care so far as concerns their relief and succor in outward things, and this is a great trust. You are stewards for the church, yea, stewards for Christ, And it is required of a steward that he be found faithful. Consider, therefore, the duty of your position and make conscious of a faithful discharge thereof, as knowing you must give an account to Christ, who has appointed you to this service, and with him there is no respect of persons. And so, Glenn, let us press onward and upward together with the church to the glory of God. We trust you. And we trust that the Lord will use you in leadership to continue to make us a better, stronger, more unified church and more godly, servant-hearted people for the glory of our great God. And so now I'm going to ask Brother Glenn if you will come up here and join me. As he makes his way, I'm going to have several questions for Glenn for him to answer in your hearing. And then after that, I have two questions for those who are members of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And yes, he makes me look quite small. (laughs) All right, six questions for you, brother. First, do you promise before God and this congregation your commitment to the inerrancy and supreme authority of the 66 books of the Old and New Testament scriptures? Can you and do you before God and this congregation affirm that you regard the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 as an excellent though not inspired expression of the teaching of God's word and do you pledge to uphold it as the doctrinal confession of this church? Do you agree before God and this congregation to seek to abide by and uphold the principles of biblical church order as set forth and applied in the Constitution of Emmanuel Baptist Church? Do you promise before God and this congregation that if you should at any time be no longer able in good conscience to hold these positions, you will immediately make them known to the elders of Emmanuel Baptist Church in an orderly and non-divisive manner? As far as you can know in your own heart, do you accept the stewardship of diaconal ministry from a sincere, though imperfect love for Christ, a genuine desire to serve his body, and a heartfelt compassion for those in need? While conscious of your own weakness and remaining sin, yet in dependence upon God's grace, 
Do you engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a deacon in Christ's church and to endeavor to adorn the gospel in your manner of life? Amen. Two questions. If you are a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, please respond. Do you who are members of this church continue to profess and do so now before all assembled your readiness to receive Glenn Trope, whom you have called to be a deacon? Do you promise by God's grace to encourage him in his service on your behalf, to pray for him and to assist him in his endeavors to minister to those in need and to care for those affairs of the church delegated to him by your pastors? Amen. I'm now gonna ask all the officers of the church, pastors and deacons to please come forward. You all right? You good? <laughs> He's already started. <laughs> Chuck, I almost did that the other day. That, that, uh, that last step's a little tricky. Okay, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come before you tonight on this occasion to lift up our voices as a church and as officers of Emmanuel Baptist Church, we thank you for the reminder that we've had tonight of of the privilege and also the serious nature of such a calling. And as we think about that and we think about our brother Glenn, we know that he would be the first to say, who is sufficient for these things? And yet we remember that your servant, the Apostle Paul, who penned those words, immediately followed that by saying that his sufficiency was in God. And so we pray for our brother that you would give him all of the strength and help that he needs to fulfill this work in a way that brings honor and glory to you. We pray that even as we, uh, the officers of the church, symbolically lay hands upon him, that that which is symboled in that act would actually be experienced by him day by day, that he would be filled with your spirit and equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit to the work that you've given him to do. And help us as a church to support him, his family, to love them, to encourage them, that he would find it to be a great joy and a blessing to serve such a people. So Father, we are thankful that you continue to give gifts to your church. We thank you for this gift that you have given to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And we give you all the praise and glory. And we offer up our prayers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And Glenn, we gladly give you the right hand of fellowship to serve in diaconal ministry and care for this congregation with us. Thank you, brother. So we now pronounce and declare that Glenn Trope has been formally elected and ordained and installed as a deacon of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Praise God. And we give God all the praise and thanks for what he has done and continues to do in our midst. And we remember that it is by his grace alone that we have what we have and we are what we are.